This is a telescope. No, really, it's a telescope. Let's take a look. Okay, so those of you who know telescopes probably have at least heard of this model. It's a portable from Mag1 Instruments. This is a 12 and a half inch f4.8 version. If you don't know telescopes, if you came to this channel, if you just stumbled upon this video for some reason, you're probably wondering what the heck is going on here. Well, yes, this is a telescope. It's designed for looking up at the night sky, and it's actually a pretty good one. These were portables made from the late 1990s through about the mid-2000s by founder Pete Smitka, sadly no longer with us. Sometime in the late 2000s, he sold the company to another entity who made some changes to some of the mechanical parts, and they're considered about equal one way or the other. This is one of the early versions from the late 1990s. It's a 12 and a half inch F4.8. Later versions were F5. Both are equally desirable. Now, these original portables were made in a number of apertures, eight inch, 10 inch, 12 and a half inch, and a 14 incher, which I haven't personally seen. But if you run across one of these in the field, there's an overwhelming probability it's going to be either an eight or a 12. It's not surprising, these are very common apertures. I remember once talking to Pete Smitka and he reminded me, the eight inch is the biggest of the small scopes and the 12 inch is the smallest of the big scopes. It also helps that eight inches and 12 inches are about one magnitude apart. That is a 12 inch will see about one magnitude deeper than an eight inch. So an eight and a 12 actually would be a good combination of scopes to own. Similarly, just as a side note, an eight inch and a four inch are also a good combination of scopes to own for similar reasons. Yeah, the ratios are a little bit off, but you get the idea. Okay, so what's the deal with this sphere? Why is this thing shaped this way? Well, this actually has its roots in amateur telescope makers who built their own telescopes and they would use a bowling ball as a bearing. So if you think about it, if you have a bowling ball, if you could figure out a way to cradle it and attach a telescope to the top, you have access to all parts of the sky. And in fact, the idea isn't new here. You've seen these used in smaller telescopes like the Edmund AstroScan and several imitators of it but this is really the first time that somebody's really taken this idea and ran with it, and we're just gonna make a whole line of telescopes just based on a spherical bottom bearing here. So let's take the case with the truss poles here out. So the mirror is a 12 and a half inch, and I'm not gonna really tilt it down here because this is quite heavy. If you've seen one of these, the diameter, the weight, and the bulk of the sphere are a lot bigger than you might expect given a 12 and a half inch aperture. And there's a couple of reasons for this. And one of them is that it has to be heavy enough so that the upper truss balances correctly and doesn't get too heavy or get too light. Another thing is they designed this thing so that the upper truss fits inside the sphere so that you can transport the thing. So we'll get to this in just a second, but there's a lid here. And if you got the electrical package, which a lot of people did, I I think just about every one of these I've seen, somebody bought that option. Along the lip here, there are three additional controls. One is a 12 volt DC charging port. One is a switch for a cooling fan. And there's a electrical connection for the truss pole that powers the accessories on the upper truss assembly. And again, there are two handles here. And this thing, it's a little heavier than you might think. There's a battery down there. There's, you know, this thing weighs about 68 to 69 pounds here. So by the way, this is the charger maintainer that they give you. You can just leave it attached to the DC charging port. This is actually quite a nice piece of equipment. So if you open up the sphere and take out the dust cover here and you look inside, you can see the mirror. You can see there is a battery down there held in by Velcro. There are collimation screws. So if you stop and think about it, conventional collimation screws that stick out the back aren't going to work here because you need the sphere to be smooth. And so he's devised a collimation cell where you actually turn these knurled knobs. There's three of them here to collimate the telescope. And again, as with many of these open truss knobs, it's, I'm often surprised at how well these things hold their collimation. So there is a cooling fan down there, and if you go to users groups and news groups and the like, some of them will debate just how effective 
that fan is. But if you think about it, if it's, say, 60 degrees inside and you take it outside and it's 30 degrees, it's still going to trap a column of warm air in here, and it's going to take a while for this to cool off and for the mirror to reach equilibrium. But if you look where the fan is positioned, it kind of doesn't really aim upwards. It's sort of sideways, and so people are saying well, all it does is just kind of swirl the air around in there. Maybe it helps a little bit. I don't know. So I have seen people modify their portable so that the fan actually evacuates the air upwards. Okay, so the interesting thing is once you get above the sphere, this actually becomes a fairly conventional open trust Dobsonian. You've got a little case here for your truss poles. And the portaball is a six truss design. There are six of these. And uh, they go on like this. So you could actually put them on in any order. But the only thing is, if you do have the electrical package, one of these, this one right here, set this down for a second, one of these does have a wire that supplies power to the upper truss assembly. And that one should go next to the port here where you plug it in. The other five can go in anywhere you like. So I'll go ahead and do this. Okay, so as with any open trust Dobsonian, really the only part of this that might cause some concern is this part where you set the upper truss on the poles. So I've got these oriented in such a way that it might help. And again, these can go on in any order, but what you want to do is if you do have the electrical package, you want this one to be near where the power pole is. So once you get this on, there are knurled knobs here, and they are all captive, so you don't have to worry about losing any of them. Okay, so once you get this assembled, the only thing left to do is to put the accessories on here. The Telrad goes just like it does normally, except that there is a power jack here. And power goes up through this truss pole. It powers the Telrad. There is a secondary dew heater. And there's even a RCA jack here for accessories. That's all it says. Uh, perhaps you want to put an eyepiece dew heater as well. So other than that, it's pretty much complete. There are two shrouds. There's one that covers the truss poles. So there's also a second shroud here. This covers the light shroud for the secondary. And it just clips on like this, halfway. And again, two captive screws hold that on, and you're pretty much done. So again, if all of this is new to you, this is how this works. We'll take the caps off of the secondary and off of the primary. So again, it's an astronomical telescope. There's a 12 and a half inch mirror here, which collects light deflects it into the secondary mirror, which deflects the light out to here. This is the focuser. You put an eyepiece in there, and that's where you look. To change magnifications, you change eyepieces. OK, so once you do have it assembled, you could use it any way you want. And one nice thing about the portable is that you are no longer constricted to this sort of two-dimensional thinking. It doesn't just go up and down and left and right. It can go in any direction. So in other words, let's say you're looking down like this, and the eyepiece is not at a convenient height. Well, you can just flick this upwards, and you can make it any height that you want. The sphere is extremely smooth. This is one of the smoothest moving telescopes I've ever used. What the manual tells you is if you want a smoother experience, you can go out and wax the sphere. One of my favorite sayings in astronomy is, honey, I'm going out to the garage to wax the telescope. So here we are with the 12 and a half inch f4.8 portaball with a focal length of somewhere around 1525 millimeters. You get this thing assembled, it really is a lot of fun. I mean, just it's just a pleasure to pan around and change the eyepiece height and just go somewhere, do whatever you want. So much fun to use. 
So unlike the 8-inch Portoball, which only has a plastic inch and a quarter helical focuser, they did that for weight savings and so the balance wouldn't be too far off. In the 12 and a half, you have a bona fide two inch Crayford style focuser so you can use your big fancy eyepieces in it. Here's a 27 millimeter panoptic yielding around 56 power. It's a great low power eyepiece. So one thing I wanna caution you on, when you take this thing outside, it does take a while for it to cool off. So that time's gonna vary. It's about 62, 63 degrees Fahrenheit indoors. It's about 30 degrees Fahrenheit outdoors here and it's gonna take a good hour, hour and a half, perhaps even two hours before the mirror reaches equilibrium and images start to settle down. So when you're doing this, you might want to either set it outside an hour or two before you're going to use it, or you could set it in the garage if the garage is going to be at ambient temperature. And the reason I point this out is because I can well picture beginners not being aware of this issue and taking this out from a warm house to a cold environment and then looking through it and then not being all that impressed with the images. You need to wait until things settle down and you'll know what it happens. Things get really quiet and peaceful in the eyepiece. So optically, there really isn't much to talk about here. Portable only used premium mirror manufacturers. Most of the ones I've seen have come with either a Zambudo or a Pegasus. This one has a Pegasus mirror in it. It has a 136th wave figure in the paperwork. Wow, it's really sharp. So mechanically, there is one thing I wanna to draw to your attention, and that is the welfare of the sphere. If you think about it, you really don't wanna scratch or dent that thing or damage it in any way because it affects the motions. And I wouldn't say this is a real problem, but talk to any portable owner, and this is always a little bit in the back of their mind. So this becomes an issue because let's say you want to move the scope for whatever reason, even from the car to the observing location, or let's say that I set up here and I, do this at, at dusk and when it gets dark, I realize, well, I should have set up about 50 feet that way. Well, it's okay, you can move the scope, but if you stop and think about it, when you take the sphere off, you're gonna to have to set it on something. And you don't wanna set it on the ground, so you gotta do something about this. So there have been a couple of creative solutions that have come about this. One is you just carry a blanket and some pillows in your car and you set the sphere down on that. Another one is you can get one of these. At one point you could get a cover for the sphere. In fact, this is the only one time I've ever seen one of these. Uh, this works really well. It's nice and soft on the inside and I've actually used it a couple of times. A third thing you can do is get an inner tube, just an inner tube about, you know, so big and you blow it up, you set it down on the ground, you can put the sphere in it. And the last thing you can do is you can just call up Portoball and get a second base and then you just put the base over in the middle there so you can play hopscotch to get it to where you want to go. So like Star Masters, Teleports, Obsessions, Teeters, and other limited production high-end Dobsonians, Portoballs have very loyal owners. There's an active users group online, and if you go to big star parties, you'll usually see at least a small contingent of Portoball owners hanging out together. So there are any concerns about Portoballs? Well, age is one of them. As I'm filming this right now, the person who bought the company from Pete Smitka announced that he is no longer making these. So spare parts and service is going to be a concern long term, especially if you have one of these older versions. Also, I've noticed in some of the older ones, electrical gremlins have a tendency to creep in. Batteries discharge for no apparent reason, upper truss assembly, electrics go in and out, dew heaters fail. And in fact, this Portable branded charger that I just praised a few minutes ago, uh, well, this one died on me over the course of the review here. I'm now using a Celestron power tank to charge the sphere. As for pricing, that's a little bit harder to pin down. When I first did a review of this product back in 1998 for scope reviews, it was just under $3,000. A lot of money even back then, by the end of the production run, it had gone to almost twice that amount. So keep in mind, if you were to price a Zambudo mirror by itself, it's going to be a lot of money to begin with. When these do come up for sale, I'm noticing they do tend to sell for good money. So no astrophotography or imaging to speak of. This is a manual tracking Dobsonian and no motors are attached to it. So, you know, for a long time, it was assumed that it was impossible to get tracking or go-to on a telescope like this, just based on the fact that 
to the spheres underneath there. But you know what? I have seen prototypes of tracking platforms that are built to accept the sphere. Hmm, very intriguing. So there you have it, a look at the portaball. I hope you get a chance to look through one of these and to use one at some point. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you soon.